A major base was located on the island of New Britain, which is at the northern end of the Solomon chain. It gave Japanese troops the naval power, supplies, and extra help they needed to control the sea lanes in the southwest Pacific. A big Japanese fleet of fighters and bombers used it as a safe haven and an air base that was almost impossible to attack. Any effort by the Allies to get back to the Philippines was met with danger at this base, which was called Rabol. Once the Allies took over Guadalcanal and the southern Solomon Islands, they came up with a plan to take this dangerous Japanese base in the summer of 1943. The operation, called Cartwheel, was planned by the combined Chiefs of Staff and was led by General Douglas MacArthur. It was supposed to have Allied troops moving forward in two big wings. One force from the west would go up the coast of New Guinea, and another from the east would climb northwest along the Solomon chain, almost the same path as New Guinea. These wings moving forward were meant to trap Rabal in a big pincer grip. Both marches were supposed to be planned with the goal of taking bases and islands so that airstrips and naval bases could be built for resupply and air assistance. Cartwheel was a small version of the big attack plan the Allies used. It was planned to end with the capture of the Admiralty Islands and was an important part of the two main plans to eventually threaten Japanese control of the Philippines. MacArthur was finally focused on the Philippines and he promised to keep his word by saying, I shall return. It was agreed upon by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and their armed staffs at the Casablanca Conference. The Southwest Pacific arm of MacArthur and Admiral William F. MacArthur was to be in charge of Bull Halsey's troops in the Southern Pacific. Halsey was in charge of the progress up the Solomon Islands chain to Bougainville. MacArthur, on the other hand, would lead the attack up the coast of New Guinea to land on New Britain and then meet up with Halsey's group on Rabol. Since Rabol was cut off, the original plan was to take the base. Soon after though, the, the combined chiefs decided that it would be better to go around Rabol than to attack it. If it could be cut off and destroyed by airstrikes from bases taken over or made by the advancing allies, then the strong and well-equipped garrison wouldn't have to be taken and people wouldn't have to die needlessly. When the choice was first made, MacArthur was against it. He said that Rabaul was too strong to be left behind his force and that it was already a great harbor that could help his advance westward. The combined chiefs did not agree with MacArthur's arguments though, and no move was ever made to take Rabaul. Even more bad news came from MacArthur when many of his and Halsey's forces were sent to help Admiral Chester W. Nimitz's push through the Central Pacific. The choice made by the combined chiefs relegated MacArthur's command over the Southwest Pacific to a supporting role. People, supplies, battleships, and transports were sent back and forth between the European theater and the Pacific theater. Plans for a Central Pacific drive and a Southwest Pacific drive toward the Philippines and then Japan also caused push and pull. Nimitz liked the Central Pacific better because it gave his aircraft carrier task groups more room to move around. He thought that the waters around New Guinea were too crowded for America's growing fleet of aircraft carriers, which meant that Japanese bombers on land could attack them. Many people thought that his goal was to keep the carriers from MacArthur. Some kind of middle ground was found in the end. Both drives were approved and they ended up helping each other out by protecting the flanks of the other and keeping the Japanese from focusing too much on one force. Halsey kept some of his warships and enough of his transports to move one reinforcement division. The second Marine Division went to the Central Pacific Drive, but MacArthur kept the first Marine Division. Different plans were used by the two leaders. William Manchester, a historian, said that Nimitz's plan was based on carrier air power protecting amphibious landings on key islands, which then became stepping stones through the enemy's defensive perimeters. MacArthur's plan, on the other hand, was to move land-based bombers forward in successive bounds to achieve local air superiority. This was because they were dealing with different landscapes and seascapes. When MacArthur took land, whether it was on small islands or going up the coast of New Guinea, 
His main goal was to take airfields or areas where they could be built. He is said to have said, Victory depends on the advancement of the bomber line. He thought of bomber and short-range fighter attacks as a kind of super mobile artillery that would come before the land assault. That was also the case when the goal of cartwheel wasn't just to neutralize Rabaul, but to take it. He knew that it would be important for his army to take control of the air over New Britain in order to beat Rabaul. In fact, air power would be very important to the cartwheel approach, especially for the jump-starting move up New Guinea. Operation Cartwheel began after Buna and Gona were captured on the Australians' drive from Port Moresby. The lessons learned in this operation were useful in running Operation Cartwheel. Bad intelligence reports and not knowing enough about the terrain, the weather, and the health of the Allied forces made it harder to take Buna than was planned. The 5th Air Force did not yet have control of the air, and the 32nd Infantry Division, which was supposed to lead the attack, had never been in a jungle battle before and did not have much artillery assistance. The attack against Buna, which had two parts, came to an abrupt end. Basically, the battle turned into a fight to the death between ground troops. The Navy didn't want to put its ships at risk in the areas off of Buna that hadn't been explored yet. The dense jungle made it hard for the air forces to find their targets, so they dropped bombs on their own troops, killing some and badly lowering morale, which was already low because of the swampy, bug-filled terrain and hot, humid air. An attack on Bun on November 19th in the rain didn't work, and neither did an all-out attack along the whole front on November 22nd. Two American troops joined the Australians in their attack on Gona and the road between Saputa and Sanananda on the same day. The Americans were working their way around the enemy position on the road, but they weren't making any progress. By November 30th, they had set up a trap behind the Japanese, cutting off their supply line to Sanananda. It took three weeks to keep this roadblock in place while desperate enemy strikes came from all sides. The guns and tanks were what mattered, not the rifles. The army was tired from the heat and humidity, as well as the many tropical diseases that were spreading. The leaders of the 32nd also didn't know how strong the Japanese defenses and troops were. In Brisbane, MacArthur, who was away from the battle and didn't know what was going on, decided that the problem must be bad leadership. He told General Robert Eichelberger, who is in charge of I Corps, to look into it and make changes if needed. Eichelberger replaced the commander, Major General Edwin Harding, even though he didn't want to, but the trouble wasn't with the leadership on the ground. History buff Jeffrey Parrott says that MacArthur seemed to be thinking of the Western Front rather than the jungles and swamps of Papua. There was no room for troops to move as they tried to get into Buna. Moving forward was like going across a bridge or into a cave. The most important things were guns and tanks, not rifles. More troops were needed, and Buna wasn't taken until they got there, along with better logistics and long-awaited air support. The Japanese defense system quickly fell apart when more men and weapons were sent in. When the experienced Australian 18th Infantry and seven light tanks arrived, they made it possible to charge along the coast. The Aussies charged between the Japanese lines and the water with their tanks acting as a wedge. Two American brigades and one Australian brigade came from the west to help clear that area. The Japanese were finally driven out of the Buna region by more strikes, even though the attacks were not very strong. But in Buna, the Allies ran into a classic Japanese defense. Strong walls made of interlocking trenches and bunkers with firing fields that blocked each other. Following the fall of Buna, more strikes were made along the coast with tanks and more troops, which the Japanese were unable to copy. By the end of December, more troops had been flown in to stop the Japanese. At the same time, the 127th Infantry Regiment moved north along the coast, and an Australian brigade put tanks in front of the Japanese roadblock in the south. 
After being attacked on January 9th, new paths to the west and up the coast were made possible. Then, the 127th was able to sneak up on the Japanese, cut them off, and go back to the coast. By January 16th, the Allies had taken over Papua New Guinea. They now only had to destroy the last few Japanese strongholds and defeat the leftover Japanese forces. In a typically grandiose statement, MacArthur said that the win was well planned and didn't cost much. In the best sense, this was wrong. There were mistakes, careless actions, and mistakes during the campaign, and it cost a lot of money. More than 4,000 Allied troops were killed, and most of them were French. In spite of that, the plan was a strategic success. MacArthur had gained airfields that he could use to attack Rabaul with Air Force bombers and fighters, as well as places from which he could watch the coming attacks on Japanese strongholds in New Guinea. MacArthur also knew that he shouldn't launch frontal strikes without first making sure there was enough artillery and air support, unless he was forced to. After the Papuan War, MacArthur had a lot more supplies and people to work for him. Before the cartwheel action began, he was in charge of four U.S. divisions, six New Zealand and Australian divisions, and a number of specialized corps, such as paratroop regiments. Navy sent some cruisers and destroyers to his area of responsibility to help out his small army. They also sent better charts of the seas around New Guinea. The most important thing was that landing craft were added. MacArthur's actions were also helped by the fact that the 5th Air Force got new bombers and fighters. The new parts, which kept getting bigger, would keep the pressure on Rabaul and other Japanese naval and air bases, and they would also help MacArthur's other actions in New Guinea. The Battle of the Bismarck Sea, March 2nd, 5, 1943, was one of the first times this extra air power was used. At Rabaul, a big group of Japanese ships was seen, which revealed their plan to strengthen one of their garrisons. People thought the target was Ley because the Japanese had landed a unit there and attacked several times before. The group set sail from Rabaul on the last day of February. The enemy was seen off Cape Gloucester, which is at the western tip of New Britain. Heavy bombers from the 5th Air Force struck it. Weak Japanese fighter support was cut off, and over the course of three days, bombers flew low and used skip bombing methods to destroy the convoy. This fight was very important to the success of Cartwheel because it scared the Japanese top leaders so much that they never sent big ships to New Guinea again to help their garrisons. Because of this, those garrisons were cut off from other areas and had a hard time getting supplies. The Allies launched more attacks on New Guinea by landing on both land and sea east of Leh, on the coast south of the Huon Peninsula, and at the same time airlifting troops to fight the Japanese from behind. After taking over the airstrip, the troops who were flown in met up with the Australian 9th Division, which had already arrived on the beaches east of Leh. A arrival by both land and sea to the west finished the three-pronged convergence on Ley. Not only did taking over the airstrips keep air control, but a well-timed attack on Japanese airfields caught many enemy planes on the ground at Wewak. This, along with Japan's promise to defend Rabaul and the central Solomon Islands, meant that the Japanese in the area did not have enough air support. The Army used Coast Watchers and intelligence teams, but Rear Admiral Daniel Barbie, who was in charge of the landing with the 7th Amphibious Force, liked using overlapping aerial photos. He thought that the interpretations of these photographs were more accurate than what landowners in the area said, because they had not seen the shore from the water. He sometimes had some of his men go on on-the-spot reconnaissance forays from rubber boats to get information. It was clear that Blamey didn't agree with MacArthur's assessment of the Japanese defensive forces size. I see, Bargi had to work on the beach approaches to the attack at Ley without any knowledge. The landing boats were not overloaded so that they could be moved easily and quickly get back to the beaches to resupply. The Navy agreed and sent four ships to go around Huan Gulf and fire on the shore. Planes were sent to help with the landing during the day, and Barbie also had the warship USS Reed out at sea with a fighter director team. 
the 9th Division landed on land near Lai on September 4th. The next day, the 7th Division flew in and landed to the north of the town. On September 11th, Salamawa was taken over, and on September 16th, Lai was too. On August 20th, 1943, Sir Thomas Blamey took charge of the Australian troops. Before the attacks against Lay, he chose to go straight to Lay instead of going around Salamawa, even though the Air Force and other people were against it. These actions would make the Japanese at Salamawa less dangerous because they would not be able to get out of there. During their conversation, he also talked about moving airborne troops up the Markham Valley. This way, the Allies could secure airfields that would let them hide their actions against Cape Gloucester. Winston Churchill talked about how important the Markham Valley was, saying that it ran northwest from Ley and had many potential airfields. The 7th Australian Division, quick to take advantage of success, used its length in a series of airborne assaults. All the operations were well planned and skillfully carried out, and the cooperation of all three fighting services was brought to a high pitch. This is what Churchill said, but it may be more accurate to say that there were disagreements and rivalries between the services in the theater. The next step was to attack Finschhofen from the sea along the coast of New Guinea, east of Ley. MacArthur and Blamey had very different ideas about how strong the enemy would be there. MacArthur thought the Japanese defense force was smaller than it really was. Because of this disagreement, there was disagreement about the right size of the attacking force needed to take Finschhafen. Blamey wanted two brigades to land, but MacArthur thought one would be enough. In the end, Blamey ordered the second ship to be sent in which led to a heated argument when Barbie didn't want to use it right away. It turned out that the Japanese were stronger than Australian intelligence had thought. Barbie only had three days to plan, build ships, and load goods before D-Day, September 22, 1943. He also only had six days to pick up troops. Barbie planned for his landing craft to arrive at the beach an hour before sunset with men and enough food and water for 15 days. This was thought to be enough time to set up temporary landing zones for air backup. In spite of this, the Japanese resistance was so strong that it took two weeks to declare Finschhafen safe. Even though the U.S. didn't like Blamey's plan, MacArthur agreed to it. Naval forces, who hoped to move along the coast of New Guinea, before the landing at Cape Gloucester, but this was the last time Blamey had any power as leader of the Allied land force. MacArthur knew how important it was to control both the seas and the air as he took his army to the Philippines. Since he was in charge of the seas north of New Guinea, he wouldn't have to go through the 1,500 miles of jungle that stood between him and the staging areas he would need to make a successful trip back to the Philippines. So, MacArthur planned to use air power to cut off the fight from the rest of the world. A big part of this air power in the New Guinea operation was using tactical air doctrines that were made by Major General Ennis Whitehead, who was the deputy commander of the 5th Air Force. Donald Goldstein, a scholar, says that Whitehead's strategies were easy to understand. This meant that he had to use his air surveillance and focus his air power on a few specific targets instead of spreading his forces out over a lot of targets. He would start by taking control of the air over a certain area. Then he would bomb the enemy's position on the ground with heavy and light bombers, cutting him off from supplies and reinforcements on both land and sea. In order to make this plan work, Whitehead sent the first task force of the 5th Air Force to Dobadura, a small village across the Owen Stanley Range from Port Moresby. His troops built 70 airfields there, to make it easier to hit Rabaul and other Japanese bases. Whitehead had surprise landings made on two islands off the coast of New Guinea, where airstrips were built to protect the base at Dobadura. Operation Chronicle was the code name for the attacks on Kirawina and Woodlark Islands, which began on June 30th, 1943. For Chronicle, Halsey gave MacArthur ships, troops, and Seabees, Navy construction battalions. He also helped Barbie in both close and faraway ways.
Barbie chose to go up to the islands at night. Many high-ranking American soldiers saw that the mission was fouled up from the start. When the landing craft got close to the beach at 8 p.m., it had trouble getting over a sandbar at the entrance to the channel and moving along the slope beach. The Japanese didn't fight back, even though there were problems and half of the men were sick at sea, Barbie moved 16,000 men and their supplies 185 miles through waters that weren't well marked without losing a single ship. Goldstein and others say that the attacks from Dobodura on Rabol were so strong that they damaged the Japanese air and sea bases at Rabol and stopped them from being a threat to the Allied push along the coast of New Guinea. Because of this, the Allied Supreme Command chose to go around Rabul instead of trying to take it. But before the Japanese air base at Wewak, which was farther up the coast of New Guinea and a threat to any further Allied progress, could be taken out, Rabul had to be bypassed. But attacks there were met with strong fighter and anti-aircraft forces, which caused a lot of casualties. So, at Nadzab, Whitehead set up the 309th Bomber Wing, which was made up of Australian and American airborne soldiers that had been dropped from troop carriers. From there, the same group of people took Marilinan, which is 40 miles southwest of Leh and Salamaua. This air base let Allied planes refuel before flying back to Dobadura, and it also let fighters help with bombing raids over Wiwak. More than 200 Japanese planes were destroyed in a raid on August 17, 1943, and Wewak was pretty much shut down. Wewak could be skipped over, just like Rabaul. Both the Army and the Navy's jungle and island tactics were shown to be weak during the battle on Guadalcanal. This led to a reevaluation that led to some of the new ideas that came out of Cartwheel. A lot of the criticism came from the idea that the command wasn't united and that the Army and Navy had different ideas about how to run missions in the uh, Southwest Pacific. Operational operations were a big problem because there wasn't enough shipping, there weren't enough unloading facilities or skilled dock workers, there weren't enough storage facilities or a good distribution system, to name a few. The Army and Navy's separate command structures and methods for making requests also played a role. There was no doubt that things were better for the Allies than for the Japanese. Things would only get worse for Japan as the Allies' air and Navy power grew. But the fact that the Allies are worried about uh, not having enough ships shows that they have thought a lot more clearly. After Guadalcanal, Planners realized how important logistics and supply methods were in island warfare, and their understanding grew even more quickly. Op cartwheel could be done with the help of 250,000 soldiers, 200 bombers, and 250 fighters. Colonel Joseph Alexander, a former Marine officer and historian, said it best. The impact of logistics on the vital element of acceleration or momentum in an opposed amphibious assault cannot be overstated. Assault troops have to run ashore almost naked. They are a storming party of riflemen and light machine gunners who can't be slowed down by having to carry heavy things. As outlined in Amphibious Doctrine, tactical sustainability comes ashore in stages, first in the form of follow-on scheduled waves, then in the form of designated on-call waves or floating dumps and finally in the form of general unloading once the beachhead has been secured to allow the unrestricted flow of boats in and out. When it came to how long unloading should take, the Navy and the landing forces had different ideas. The Marines thought that the commander in charge of the beachhead should be in charge of the offloading processes. He would figure out what materials were needed and how they should be put together. The Navy put the safety of the fragile transports above all else and insisted on controlling the offloading process to make sure it went as quickly and smoothly as possible so that the ships could leave the dangerous shore. In the Solomon Islands, the Navy mostly got what it wanted because when the Allies landed, the Japanese responded by attacking the attacking troops and their ships from the air and the sea. 
Then, how much unloading had to be done around the clock before the boats could go back out to sea was used to judge how well the Navy way worked. There were some problems with the landing at Finshofen on September 22, 1943, and Japanese planes attacked, but the landing and unloading went faster than ever before. The landing ships were on their way back to Ley to pick up the follow-up forces by sunrise on the 23rd. Admiral William Halsey was in charge of the right wing of the cartwheel operation, which was very far to the southeast. His general was in charge of 250,000 people, including service members. His army commander was in charge of four divisions, as well as the 1st and 3rd Marine Divisions. There were 200 bombers and 250 fighters of all types from the Marine Corps, Navy, and New Zealand Air Forces in the Solomons area, which was also known as Air Sols. Nimitz usually gave Halsey the ships he needed for a specific task, so he didn't have a big fleet that was always there. A force that could go on land or sea and two groups of eight ships and 16 destroyers made up his amphibious force at the start of Cartwheel. He was also helped by the Saratoga and the Enterprise, two aircraft carriers, and the task groups that went with them. MacArthur was determined to use all the troops he was in charge of to march toward Rabaul after Guadalcanal fell. Halsey's main goals were in MacArthur's theater. The Russell Islands are part of the Solomon chain. According to Manchester, Halsey was proud to serve under MacArthur and that he and his men had become MacArthur's right wing. The Admiral planned to attack up the long ladder of the Solomons toward Rabaul, trapping the city between Halsey on the east and MacArthur on the west. Taking over the airfields at Munda on New Georgia Island was the first step in Halsey's Solomon part of the cartwheel plan. Halsey came up with a pretty easy plan to drop a division east of the airfield. Take the field and break through the Japanese defenses. At the same time, another amphibious arrival would happen on the island's north coast to drive southwest and take the harbor to stop the Japanese from leaving. The landing parties were to be helped by guns from Rendova, a nearby island that had already been taken. For the first part of the plan to work, they chose to land early at Segei. Since there weren't enough ships for full-scale attacks, only small groups went ashore at Segei and the three other landing spots where there weren't many Japanese. If the Japanese were able to take over Segei before the Americans got there, it might take more men to take it over, which would mess up the complicated cartwheel schedule. After landing, a harbor was set up for restocking and work on an airstrip at Segei Point began. The main landings were moved east of Munda airfield because of worries that Japanese troops would be too strong at the original site. When the Allied troops tried to move toward Munda, they were met with strong Japanese resistance. The Japanese had built a very strong defense with roadblocks and lines of defenses armed with automatic weapons east of Munda. They were able to stop the troops on the Munda Trail and the regiments on the beach from talking to each other. It was hard to get supplies and confidence dropped. Frontal strikes in this area didn't make much progress. That was something MacArthur had already learned in New Guinea. The attack in the north of the island didn't go much better because the terrain was tough and the Japanese were determined. There needed to be more help too but the Navy support task groups were having their own issues. While the Allies had more ships than the Japanese in the area, the Japanese long lance torpedo was still the best weapon they had. A Japanese task force that was bringing more troops into the battle ran into an American task group and sank a ship. Later, another Japanese force got through even though it was being attacked from the air but it didn't make it to the garrisons on New Georgia. The Allies, on the other hand, kept getting stuck because the Japanese were fighting back. Halsey sent Major General Oscar Griswold to look into it, and he found that the troops were dispirited, exhausted, and suffering from low morale. 
He didn't like the dual command system, and he thought that the 43rd Division on the island would break under the pressure if they weren't given more help soon. Because of this, more troops were sent to join the invasion force, making it twice as big. The force was now the right size, as it should have been from the start. American leaders tended to underestimate the Japanese resistance at first, which meant they didn't commit enough troops. I had to work hard to learn that lesson. After a lot of artillery, air, and naval gunfire was used to destroy the Japanese fixed defenses, a new attack was scheduled to start on July 25th. After taking a lot of damage, the Japanese retreated to their defense lines in the back. Some retreated even more, leaving only a small area around Munda Point. This let the Americans take over the airport. The Americans didn't take over the port for another three weeks though, so the Japanese were able to move most of their leftover troops to the islands of Kolombangara and Banga. Banga was quickly taken over by the US. A Japanese supply convoy was sunk off the coast of Kolombangara, cutting off the troops that were there from the rest of the world. The troops were planning to fight for control of the island, if not to try to take back New Georgia. When the Allies attacked the convoy, they threw about 1,500 Japanese prisoners into the water. When Halsey chose to take Vela Lavella, an undefended island to the north, he successfully cut off the Japanese troops, who were then moved to southern Bougainville in a series of operations. Like MacArthur's troops in New Guinea, the Navy was getting good at sneaking up on strong garrisons to cut them off and send them to their own island. Even though the Japanese were still in a defensive retreat, they still had a big enough naval force to get their men out of harm's way and save them for another battle. The next big test on Halsey's way up the Solomon's Ladder was at Bougainville. The methods were very different, but the overall strategy stayed the same. The goal was to take over and protect air bases from which fighters could help long-range bombers from Munda and Papua New Guinea hit Rabol. The Japanese had built a number of airstrips and stationed almost 60,000 soldiers on Bougainville and the islands close. An assessment of the Japanese forces' positions showed that they were best at the southern tip of Bougainville on the southern Shortland Islands and in the north and around the airport on the eastern shore. Because of how long they had to spend on Munda and how strong the Japanese were in the south, the original plan to attack was thrown out. Because of this, Empress Augusta Bay on the island's western shore was picked as the place to land. Because of the thick jungle, the long distances, and the fact that Japanese troops were spread out, it would take the enemy a long time to move to help any threatened points that were not near Japanese garrisons. They thought they were up against a stronger force than actually showed up and they lost a lot of soldiers in the process. It was clear that Halsey did not have enough men to fight the 35,000 Japanese who were protecting the airstrips. It wasn't necessary for the Allies to take over the whole island. They only needed to hold a small part of it so they could build an airstrip. The Japanese thought that the Americans would attack them through the bush where they thought they could do a lot of damage. But by March 1944, it was clear to the Japanese that the Americans were going to stay defensive and that they would have to fight from the front if they wanted to win and take out the important airfield. Earlier landings were made in the Treasury Islands to help Bougainville and to draw attention away from him. Another landing was made on the island of Choiseur, south of Bougainville but it was mostly used as a bluff. The Japanese would have thought that an attack on that island would be the next logical step in their plan to take over other islands. So they would be completely fooled by the feint, even though the Americans didn't really care about that island. The bypassing method, which would become very important later, was still being tested at this point. However, the attack on Choiseul looked good for the plan because it was easy to take and the Japanese were fooled. 
The parachute battalion launched an amphibious attack on Choiseul and took out the enemy installations that were easy to reach while defending themselves. The Japanese struck from the north and south because they thought they were up against a stronger force than had actually arrived. They were pushed back with a lot of casualties. When the Americans landed on Empress Augusta Bay, it became clear what their real plan was. So the company left to join the forces on Bougainville. Choiseau was rendered useless by the action. With the Americans on Bougainville, he had no use. It turned out that the bombing didn't work at Bougainville either. Airstrikes that had been going on for weeks before the landing were part of the preliminary attacks. Marine planes were attacking enemy airfields on the island and in nearby areas, which could make it harder to land. Soldier and Navy planes from Guadalcanal and other islands in the Solomon Islands helped them. Shipborne planes also joined in, attacking sites in New Britain and New Ireland. The goal was to stop the Japanese from using airstrips that were close enough to attack Empress Augusta Bay. Most of these attacks worked, but some fighters and dive bombers took too long to dump at the beaches. The covering fire only lasted 11 minutes on November 1st, D-Day, because the Japanese were thought to have few, if any, troops nearby. The landing spot was bombed and strafe attacked before the first wave of amphibious assault troops arrived. The attack was led by the 3rd and 9th Marines and the Raider Regiment, minus one company. The 21st Marines and the 37th Infantry Division were held back. The I Marine Amphibious Corps was made up of these 34,000 men. As the barrage went on, the transports bringing troops and supplies lined up off the beach. Damagers fired a lot of shells at Cape Torokina, which was known to have enemy positions according to information. Ships went by the Cape and let their main guns go. While the transports were waiting to go ashore, Marine fighters and bombers attacked the landing spot at the last minute, but it didn't really make a difference. John A. Lorelli, a naval historian, wrote, The first wave was getting close to the beach when it became clear that both bombardments had failed. A 75 ml Wagner gun was hidden in a bunker behind the southern beaches and was used by the troops to kill many. The leader of the leading boat team was one of the first people killed when his LCVP blew up. Thirteen other boats were hit by enemy fire, sinking three. What this gunshot did was mess up the first wave, but it didn't stop the landing. When the assault troops were moving in, boats bringing them were shot at from two nearby islands. Their noise was quickly drowned out by a landing party. But as the attack units got closer to the beach, they were hit hard by heavy fire from small arms, mortars, and artillery. It turned out that the Japanese had added 300 men since the last scouting trip by boat. These men were really dug in and ready to put up a strong fight. Even though there was enemy fire, the landings went through. However, the unexpected resistance and the loss of the boat carrying the leader of the boat group threw the attack off track. Lots of the units landed in places that weren't where they were supposed to be. The beachhead was very small because of these things and the fact that the 9th Marines landed on a very steeply sloped beach with high waves. The beachhead was also limited by how dense the jungle was. There were many swampy places in the jungle that made it hard for the assault troops to move through. But by the end of the first day, the 3rd Amphibious Force had brought 14,000 soldiers and 6,000 tons of supplies ashore. The trucks left, and people who lay mines started to set them up off the beach. There were some problems with the landing in the north, but it went pretty well in the center and south. The Japanese troops did not fight back, but the bad surf and beach conditions slowed down the arrival. The steep beaches made it hard for landing craft to get to land, and soon the water was full of wrecked LCMs and LCVPs. As a result, the landing plan was changed so that the northern ships went to the south. 
Even though the Japanese attacked from the air, the transports were unloaded and back at sea by dark. The action at Bougainville was a lot like the one at Guadalcanal. The attack's only goal was to take and protect a vital airfield site. At first, taking over the whole island wasn't necessary. There were also some similarities in the general look of the land and how the enemy acted in some situations. Some things were the same though. In contrast to Guadalcanal, the Japanese did not have enough supplies, so there was never any question about the outcome at Bougainville. The Americans would have to build their own airstrip at Bougainville, which was another difference that affected their military goals. As it turned out, this wasn't because there weren't any on the island. The Japanese had three airstrips that worked. The Japanese knew that the airstrips would be targets and they held on tight. So there was no way to achieve strategic surprise. Instead, it made sense to attack where no one was expecting it to happen. Parachutists were very important in this battle, but not on Bougainville itself. There was a parachute attack on the Treasury Islands, southeast of Empress Augusta Bay, by the 8th New Zealand Brigade Group four days before the attack on Bougainville. This action was meant to be a feint to take the enemy's attention away from the main effort and stop a possible threat to the Allies' communication lines. Even though the Allied troops faced strong opposition, the area was cleared in two weeks. Ten planes were lost, and six Japanese cruisers and two destroyers were badly damaged. But Halsey was worried that his Navy force wasn't strong enough. He thought Kenny's Papuan bombers gave him enough planes. A lot of warships were lost or injured in earlier battles in the Central Solomons, and almost all of the new ships being built were destined for the Mediterranean. What wasn't was given to the Central Pacific push by Nimitz. Admiral T.S. Wilkinson's 3rd Amphibious Force and 12 ships with 11 destroyers as backup were what Halsey had to use to attack Bougainville. Soon, the Japanese cruisers that were supposed to attack the beachhead did so. The U.S. showed how much they had learned since Guadalcanal by being ready. During the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay, U.S. Army reconnaissance planes saw a large group of enemy cruisers and destroyers. In response, Allied Navy forces used a flanking attack to push them back. Admiral Halsey's biographer says that two destroyer divisions were split off and raced along the enemy's flanks, attacking with torpedoes. At the same time, cruisers firing their guns made a series of 180-degree turns at the same time, crossing the enemy's T over and over again, each time getting a little closer. This made the Japanese run away in confusion. At dawn, the Americans stopped chasing the enemy and got ready for the inevitable air attack, which did happen. For just two small hits, the Japanese lost 17 planes. Two days later, on November 4th, planes from the Solomon Islands saw another group of four destroyers and eight cruisers from Japan, leaving Truk on their way to Rabaul. With the light carrier, Princeton added to the Saratoga carrier group they could attack the force while it was refueling in Rabaul. Most people think that carrier troops shouldn't attack a strong, well-defended base, but this had to be done to protect the Marines on Bougainville. The island of Vela La Vela had just been taken over, so the carrier force had air cover and could send 100 fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo planes against the Japanese force that had been grounded at Rabaul just two hours before. The attack was a big success. Ten planes were lost and six cruisers and two destroyers were damaged. When Halsey heard the news, he said, the results opened, the stops for a funeral dirge for Tojo's Rabaul. The beachhead wasn't much deeper after three days, but the troops hadn't faced any real resistance since the first day. There were many important things that helped the Marines on Bougainville one of the most important was the rough environment. For one thing, the swamp they were facing stopped the beachhead from growing, but it was also a good defense against enemy attempts to push them back. 
Also, the land didn't look like a good place for an airstrip, which may help explain why the Japanese were so confused when they saw the Allies on the island. They had no idea what the Allies were trying to do, so they only fought in a confusing and unsure way. The Japanese didn't try to get rid of the Allies in a serious way until the Marines had left and the CBs and engineers had built a base that could be used. There was a big Japanese assault in March. It was aimed at Hill 700, which is on the American border. There were a lot of hills and valleys around the edge, and Hill 700 was right in the middle, high above the rest of the land and giving a good view of the airport. The Americans knew that the Japanese were going to attack soon, so they made plans to have a strong backup force ready to fight the Japanese wherever they tried to break through. The huge strike started on March 8th and at one point, the Japanese took over part of the hill. The attackers were finally pushed back by forces from the 37th Division, who killed a lot of people while taking back the hill. On March 13th, the Japanese gave up on their plan. New Britain, the island where Rabaul was located, was taken over on December 15, 1943. General Walter Kruger was in charge of the 6th Army which was told to take the Arawa Peninsula, which is southeast of Cape Gloucester. If it was taken, the western tip of New Britain would be cut off from Rabul. It had a small harbor from which it was possible to control the Vitias and Dampier Straits, which cut New Guinea off from New Britain. Kruger chose the 112th Cavalry Regiment to lead the amphibious action. Other supporting units such as artillery, engineers, and others, were also sent. There wasn't much training for the 112th in amphibious assault landings. The harbor was full of coral, and amphibious tractors and tanks had to be used instead of landing boats. Kenny promised air support, and the ships in the Pacific Fleet sent planes. Supposedly, airway would not be well protected, but as the 112th Cavalry got closer to the landing spots, they were quickly met with heavy machine gun fire. Even so, the Japanese quickly had to withdraw because the Americans had more powerful weapons. Through the middle of the afternoon, the 112th had made a base. The Japanese started a fierce air attack that would last for several days and focus on the American ships that were helping with the landings. Along with that, they sent more infantry to dig in just outside the bridgehead defenses. Kruger added more troops to the 112th, including a marine tank company and more soldiers. American troops drove the Japanese out of their trenches by using marine tanks to fire on them. Barbie's biographer says that during the war, many firsts were made, such as the first use of tractors, rockets, an LSD, and an Australian LSI, LCTs as medical centers, a specially trained naval beach party, landing craft control officers, Barbie's idea, and the use of carrier aircraft in close support. In earlier tests, it took three hours for LSTs to unload. At ROA, it took less than an hour. It already took a month to fight. The ditches weren't taken over until January 16th, after 118 Americans were killed and 352 were hurt. There needed to be two more bases to fully protect New Guinea's right side. During the fierce battle at ROA, Kruger began an operation to take over the airfield at Cape Gloucester, which is on the very western tip of New Britain. It was possible to attack Rabaul from the east-west and south at the same time because it had airstrips there and in the eastern Solomon Islands. The attack, which was called Operation Backhander, was similar to Ara, but was carried out on a bigger scale. The air plan from Whitehead and the Navy forces in the Southern Pacific area, led by Admiral Barbie, had to work together to attack Cape Gloucester. Other amphibious actions used the coordinated attack and the idea of getting ready that were used in the invasion. The target was heavily bombed by air all day and night for a week before the attack. Every day, Shorter scouting missions were also done to check out the damage and find new targets. A lot of planning from the Navy and well-coordinated sea patrols 
stop the Japanese from getting more supplies and reinforcements to Cape Gloucester. During the attack, naval gunfire and air support were organized, and heavy B-17 Flying Fortress bombers were sent to help when they were asked. When the Allied men arrived, the Japanese were already tired. The Navy had to learn how to use its new tools the hard way, starting with a shaky group of half-trained soldiers and not enough ships. Barbie, on the other hand, said that naval gunfire was not a cure, all and was only sometimes useful. Naval bombardment, he wrote, works great against fixed targets, but not so well when firing into a thickly rainforest that goes almost all the way to the shore. Also, naval gunfire's flat trajectory didn't work to get the Japanese out of their pillboxes. Bombing specific targets from the air was better, but we couldn't be sure of pinpoint accuracy or exact time. It also didn't help much to bomb the beaches with planes. The 1st Marine Division was supposed to do the landing, but they hadn't been in an amphibious operation since Guadalcanal, and the Marines and Navy leader got into a fight over how many transports they would need. The landing area was bombed from the air for three weeks before Barbie's landing craft brought the Marines to the beach. Barbie's assistant repair officer also developed a new offensive firepower carrier that helped the attack. Two of the LCIs were equipped with rocket launchers, which gave the landing troops more firepower and close assistance. To get around the Japanese, who had set up defenses around the airstrip, Kruger landed the troops on an undefended beach about six miles from the airport. Little pushback was seen, and the landing and unloading went without a hitch. The new method, which was first tried on Bougainville, of having trucks that were already loaded drive from the LSTs to a set supply area greatly sped up the process. The Marines didn't face much resistance when they attacked the airport because the Japanese were already outflanked. But the Japanese fought back harder when the Marines tried to clear the woods to the east. The Americans were used to fighting in this way, and the worst fighting happened when they tried to attack a well-hidden bunker complex along the bank of a stream that they later named Suicide Creek. The Marines lost a lot of men and were pushed back for two days. Engineers from the Army had to build a log road through the bush before tanks could be brought up close enough to hit the Japanese bunkers directly. This shows how important American tanks were to MacArthur's offensive plans because they could help eliminate some Japanese firepower. Japanese defensive positions like pillboxes made of logs were often so well built and well hidden that they couldn't be hit by weapons from ships or from the ground. They had to be attacked straight on. The tank gave the Americans better firepower and the ability to move quickly to help on the ground. The attack on the Admiralty Islands, which are 200 miles northeast of Rabol, was the next step in the march to the Philippines. Getting rid of Rabol was seen as necessary as early on as taking over the Admiralties. They were also great places to build buildings that would help with the trip to the Philippines. On February 28, 1944, 1,000 men landed on the island of Los Negros to start the invasion of the Admiralties. MacArthur went with the troops. Resistance was light, and by the end of the day, two attackers had been killed, three had been hurt, and an airfield had been taken. After a month of heavy battle in which 326 Americans were killed, and over 1,000 were hurt in the Admiralties, the Japanese defenders were no longer a strong enough force to fight. As soon as the Admiralties were taken, the Japanese base of Rabol was surrounded. From Bougainville and Cape Gloucester, bombers hit Rabol from dawn until dusk, cutting off supply lines and destroying sites. Things were going badly with the big Japanese base very quickly. The Japanese were already moving ships and planes out of Rabol and toward Truk, which was their stronghold in the Carolines. At the same time, they were digging in 100,000 men to fight off the attack that never came. Once the cartwheel was done, the Allies moved their assault to the Philippines. The commanders and soldiers may have gained the most from the successful operation by learning new strategies and getting better at the ones they already used. 
Charles Koberger talks about the most important turning points in the Pacific War in his book about the Solomon's operation. The battles of Midway and the Coral Sea are, of course, at the top of the list. He thinks that the naval battle of Guadalcanal was even more important. This battle made it possible for the Allies to move in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. While Koberger was right when he said that the Solomon's operation was very important to the war effort, it was also very important to the Allies because it gave them the experience and training they needed to keep fighting the Japanese. He says it so well. The Navy got better and better to work with from a hurried group of half-trained men and too few ships, but it had to learn how to use it the hard way. The Navy learned a lot during their time in the Solomon Islands. It had paid with ships, planes, and blood for this. The Americans were hurt in the Solomon Islands and had to change how they thought about peacetime and learn new skills.